in telling your neighbor, God bless you, you take your position as a resistor. And I hate to tell you that because some of you probably don't like to be a resistor. You probably didn't sign up for the resistance. But when you said, God bless you, you did. And you're going to learn why I say that. When I was growing up, I noticed that when my parents said hello to someone and said, how are you on Sunday morning, everybody responded with, I am blessed. Even when they were experiencing crisis or even when they had earlier testified that they were battling illness or suffering in poverty or confronting some kind of emotional or economic or relational difficulty, many of the people in church, just about all of themselves, called themselves blessed. Now, I assumed that they were not being completely honest. And I came to believe then that, oh, this was just a simple convention of religious conversation. Someone says, how are you? You say, I am blessed. It sounds pious. And they just kept saying, no matter how things were going, and I just said, well, even when they weren't even blessed, they said it. I am blessed. They even had a song that we sang every Sunday. The Lord is blessing me right now. Oh, yes, right now. Right now. Poor, sad, upset. And they sang with full throated affirmation. The Lord is blessing me right now. And even as a small child, in my cynicism, as a small child, I was conditioned by the order of our culture to only see blessing in material things. Because if they were not wealthy, if they were not powerful, they not have so many possessions, I didn't, I didn't think that they were blessed. And as I grew into my own faith, I began to understand a little more clearly. These people were not being dishonest. They were not simply putting on a brave face. They were not living in denial about the struggles in their lives. What I did not understand at the time was that these followers of Jesus, and that's what they were, these followers of Jesus accepted what Jesus proclaimed about life with God. That in God, regardless of what is going on around them, with God, you are blessed. So then the obvious question becomes, what do we mean when we describe someone or ourselves as being blessed? Do we locate our own blessing in our poverty, in our grief, in our meekness, in our integrity, in our persecution, in our mourning? Or have we been conditioned to consider the presence of wealth, health, and success to be signs of God's blessing. It's rhetorical, but please answer it in your own mind. If we pause to think about it, our religious language and our spiritual practices reflect an imperial mindset that God blesses us after we have succeeded. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. Pastor, I'm not going to church until I get myself together. I, 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 no, I, you know, I don't know how to pray. I'm not going to pray until I get right. You, you've heard these things. Oh, uh, God wouldn't even know how I sounded because I'm just so, you know, I've done so much stuff. I, I, I just can't even, you know. We have accepted even in church an imperial mindset that says, I will not get blessed until after I've done all I need to do. 
I will not get blessed until I'm already good and holy. But this is not how Jesus described blessings to his disciples and his followers. In our text today, which is the beginning of what is known as Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gathers his disciples and his followers to teach them what it means for them that the kingdom of heaven has come near. Before these disciples and followers go any further in their relationship with Jesus, they need to know something right then and right there. They need to know that they are blessed. Just as they are. Before they've done anything, before they've professed anything, before they've followed Jesus, before they've done anything, Jesus wants them to know. Before, I don't care what, I just met you. And guess what? You are blessed. That's what Jesus did. Before we get to anything else, before I talk to you about what you're supposed to do in church, before I talk to you how you're supposed to treat your neighbor, right now, as you sit, wherever you are, whatever your condition is, you are blessed. See, some of you are not convinced. We've been in church so long, you, you think that you've got to come and do communion before God will bless you. You are blessed. Jesus knows that these people have accepted and adapted to a world that celebrated the successful, the rich, Caesar. Jesus knows that his disciples and followers have been conditioned to believe that those who oppressed them are the ones who are truly blessed. And Jesus also knows that many of those sitting in that crowd following him were suspicious that somehow they deserved to be poor. They deserved to be sick. They deserved to be oppressed. They believed that. That my condition, the where I sit now, my poverty, my slavery, I deserve it. And I deserve it because if I didn't deserve it, I will be rich. I would be wealthy. I would be okay. That's what they thought. And so Jesus, through these beatitudes, sets out to disabuse his followers that God is found solely in the powerful and in the privileged and those who are doing well. Jesus declared that they, you, you are the ones who have found God's favor even before you have done anything. In this opening salvo in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is laying off, and here we go, the ultimate alternative lifestyle. This is the alternative lifestyle that Jesus has been preaching about. The one where you know yourself to be blessed of God because guess what? You are God's beloved and God loves you and gives you grace and mercy without you having to lift a finger to do anything to get it. In these beatitudes, in these blessings, in these conditions that Jesus gives, Jesus is pronouncing God's faith. Their conditions, his disciples' conditions, their acts, whatever they're doing right now, their acts of faith, their belief, all of that, it may not bring wealth or prosperity or it, it may even bring on more persecution. But in it, know that you are blessed that God sees, knows, and understands what you're going through. And here's what I want you to also notice in these blessings that Jesus pronounced. Not once, not once will you find in Jesus' pronouncement of blessing any connection to any material, economic, political, or social advantage. Not once would you say, Jesus say, oh, you got to get right before you come to me. You didn't hear it. In these blessings, we find nothing in what Jesus called blessed, a reference to the wealthy or to the powerful, to the privileged. In these blessings, there is no prosperity gospel. There is no buying the cloth so you will be blessed. There is no blueprint for wealth or success. None of it. Not found here. No, these beatitudes are an indictment of the world. So, so. 
When you told your neighbor, God bless you, you said it without knowing what condition your neighbor was in. You don't know what your neighbor is going through. You don't know what is under him, but you said, God bless you. You resisted the notion that somehow that your neighbor is blessed because they have wealth or some other advantage. You were resisting the order of the world. So every time we say, God bless you, we are pronouncing blessing, regardless of what the world says is an indication of God's favor. We are subverting the empire. Jesus declares that the values, commitments, and practices of the empire are not the source of God's favor. God is not found there. God is found. God is found. Blessed are those who have been beaten down and have nothing and have given all they know how to give just to be. For they will have everything that they need in the reign of God. Blessed are those who weep at how cold and hard the world is. God is with them. Blessed are those who don't resort to violence and vengeance to get ahead. They will receive everything that they desire. And blessed are those who work so hard for justice. For they will experience the very justice and righteousness that they seek. Blessed are those who forgive and show compassion. They will receive God's forgiveness and compassion. Blessed are those who live and serve with integrity and honesty. They will always perceive God's presence. Blessed are those who seek wholeness and well-being for all of God's creation. For they truly are children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for living and acting in light of Jesus' gospel of liberation and love. They will be rewarded. These are the blessings that Jesus pronounced on the weakest and most marginalized. These blessings fall on all creation because God is good and merciful. The great 20th century writer, Kurt Vonnegut, critical of Christianity, but said something very profound. Why don't Christians post the Beatitudes in their public buildings? Why do they always post the Ten Commandments? And he went on to say, because can you imagine blessed are the poor in the courtroom? Or blessed are the peacemakers at the Pentagon? And this is a powerful commentary because he knows and we know that Christian, the Christian witness has become inextricably linked to the empire. We have accepted and adjusted to the world's distortion of the gospel. And so that's why it's hard for us to find blessing in things that are not successful, in things that are not already doing well. You know it. In our world, the poor are just lazy. In our world, those who grieve are just pitiful. In our world, those who strive for justice are just pathetic dreamers. In our world, those who are meek are just unrealistic. Get, get a grip. For those who are peacemaker, in our world, peacemakers are unpatriotic. They just don't, they don't love America enough. In our world, the merciful are considered bleeding hearts. And in our world, the persecuted are just weak. They deserve what they get. That's how our world operates. That's how our world operates. And yet, Jesus subverts it. Jesus subverts that notion, telling people right there in front of him, people without very much, people who are oppressed, people who don't know what's going to happen in their lives next, and says right there in their presence, before anything else, you are blessed. God favors you. And so right here, right now, all of us, Jesus' sermon, these pronouncements of blessings are a call to us to resist the ways the empire distorts the gospel. 
God's blessing can be found in people and places least likely to be celebrated in our culture. And so before you ban a whole people and a whole religion, be careful that you are not banning the revelation of God in your very midst. Before you throw up walls against people, be careful that you're not missing out what God wants to show you in someone that you think is objectionable. I say it every day to the churches out there that reject our LGBTQ family. Before you reject anybody, you better be careful that you are not rejecting the very Jesus who pronounces favor on all God's children. Be careful. We must resist. We must resist the cultural perspective that says that money and power are the only ways to experience a blessed life. We must resist the political and economic wisdom that dismisses the poor and the sick and immigrant as problems to be legislated away or to be legislated out of sight and out of mind. We must accept that God's blessing on the least of these is an intentional disruption of the imperial order. And so when you leave here, I want you to keep this in, a, in your mind. For all of us who can't seem to catch a break, but who hold on to Jesus and the good in our lives with, with like just grim, grim grip, for all of us who've been relegated to the margins as unneeded, unuseful, for all of us who have been left behind, discounted, and discarded. For all of us who have done all that we know what to do but find ourselves emotionally, spiritually, and economically and politically depleted. And we can't seem to go any further. For those of us who always feel unseen, unheard, and unloved, this letter, this proclamation is our proclamation. God is blessing you. God blesses us. And if you hear nothing else that I've said today and you don't understand anything I said or you disagree with anything I ever said, here's my message to you and I pray down it, pray with all my fervor that you understand it. God bless all of you. Amen.